All right, I've told you the various kinds of worldviews that are available. I've told you that when you do an internal critique of these worldviews, you're going to be looking for arbitrariness or inconsistency. You have that in mind? Now let me do an internal critique of materialistic atheism. Let's see what kind of problems the atheist has in his worldview. When we get done, I think you'll be rather surprised. From a philosophical standpoint, atheism has no credibility whatsoever. Some people want to know how uh, we can defend the Bible as the Word of God or Christianity as a worldview. And Dr. Van Til used to put it this way, very simply put, our apologetic is that unless Christianity is true, you can't prove anything at all. The proof that Christianity is true is that without it, you can't prove anything at all. To put it in a real sophisticated way, the Christian worldview is the transcendental precondition of intelligibility. It is the precondition, what, it, what must be the case and assumed to be the case for anything in human experience to be intelligible. Okay, the easier way of remembering it is the proof of Christianity is that if it is not true, you couldn't prove anything at all. So the atheistic materialist comes along and says, well, Christianity is not true. There is no God. There is no soul. There is no afterlife. There's just this life. There's just matter. That's all there is. There is no spiritual reality. There's just the physical cosmos. No God. No soul no afterlife. And that's what we're going to talk about for a few minutes. My answer to that is, is that if that were the case, you couldn't know that it was the case and you couldn't prove anything at all. The problem of induction might also be called the problem of causality or the uniformity of nature. All science, all science, all of it, all science rests upon inductive inference. Okay, I'm going to explain to you what an inductive inference is in just a second. But the first thing I want to point out is I'm not just talking about biology or physiology or psychology or mathematics. Any science depends upon inductive inference. Inductive inference takes something that we've experienced in the past and projects it into the future. Here's a good example of inductive interest, inductive inference not performed in the science classroom. You get up in the middle of the night and are walking around in the dark and you stub your toe. You go, ouch. The next night when you get up to walk around in the middle of the night in the dark, you're careful not to stub your toe again. Seems very simple. That's an inductive inference. If stubbing my toe last night hurt, stubbing my toe tonight will hurt as well. Because the way things were in the past, in terms of causal um, relationships, you know, bumping your toe in the bedpost like that, leading to pain and going up into your brain, going, ah! That kind of relationship is going to be the kind of relationship I encounter in the future, too. Now, can you see why all science depends upon that? What we learn about the past must be projectable into the future. All science rests upon the uniformity of nature. If there were no uniformity in the natural world, then all your scientific experiments would be a waste of time, wouldn't they? Because you could learn everything you wanted about chemical interactions on Tuesday, but on Wednesday that information would be useless to you. And so, in a very broad sense, induction is the view that the future will be like the past. The future, future relationships between events will resemble past relationships between events. I will now do sophisticated scientific experiment for you. What will happen if I let go of this marker? 
in this room under the present gravitational barometric conditions, what will happen to this marker? You have never ever seen this experiment done before. Do not try to generalize from apples that have fallen to the floor or silverware that you've knocked off the table. Don't try to generalize at all. You've never seen this experiment. What will happen when I let go of the marker? Do not rely upon past knowledge. What will happen to the marker? What? The good philosophers are saying, we have no way of knowing if we can't rely on any past experience. This is the first time we've encountered it. Who knows what will happen the first time? Okay, so now remember that. You don't know. I'm now going to do the experiment. Watch closely. There is no trickery involved. What happened when I let go of this? Phil, okay, now. We're going to do a second experiment. You now know that one time, 20 seconds ago, this fell when I let go of it. We are now, we will presume under the same atmospheric, gravitational, and barometric conditions. What will happen when I let go of it this time? What will happen? You don't know. And the reason you don't know is because you have no basis for inductive intra inference. You don't know that the future, or what has become present, will be like the past. That was 20 seconds ago. And you say, yeah, but it's the same conditions. But see, you assume that under the same conditions, one event will lead to the same event. You are assuming the uniformity of nature. Now, to be a good philosopher, theoretically, I could let go, and this time it might float upward, right? It might turn into a dove. Who knows what would happen when you let go the second time? No one knows unless the past is a key to the future. You all with me? And now pretend, for argument's sake, that you are an atheistic materialist. I'm a Christian, and I say, the reason I'm going to the science lab today to continue my investigations is because I know that there is a sovereign personal God who governs this universe, who made it and controls it and has made it regular so that I can learn about it, I can make projections and have dominion over it, to use theological language. I am able to govern chemical reactions. and. Uh, and, and crocodiles, and I can make industrial plants, and even rockets that go to the moon, because of the information I've learned in the past can be brought together, projected into the future. As a Christian, I have no problem with that. What I want to know is why you are going to the science lab today. Now, I've tried to do this in a somewhat light-hearted form, so you may not realize this, but that is what's considered a savage criticism. I have savaged my opponent. He's dead. He's not getting up off the ground from this one. Okay, let me show you the most common way that a person will try to recover from this problem of induction. The atheist says we live in a random universe. He has no right to rely on inductive inference. He has no reason to expect causality or simply the uniformity of nature. He has no basis for believing in the uniformity of nature. But if he has no basis for the uniformity of nature, he has no basis for doing science. It's gone. Kaput. Biology, astronomy, chemistry, psychology, history, grammar, all of it is gone. There are no sciences without inductive inference. And you as a Christian, you understand within your worldview why we do all those sciences, because you believe in inductive inference and you got a good reason for it. The atheist doesn't. But here's his comeback. He will often say something like this. Well, very probably the future will be like the past. Very pro I can't tell you for sure that the marker is going to drop the second time, but very probably it will. And the reason why it very probably will is because it has always done so in the past. And here's where we find out just how good your philosophical discernment is. Anybody notice the trick that was pulled right there? The person who says very probably the future will be like the past is smuggled right back into the argument the thing he's supposed to prove. And let me show you why. 
When I say that the future will probably be like the past, I'm basing that on what? Past information. What I'm saying is, in the, please don't get lost in this, in the past, the future has always resembled the past. Okay? If I go back to T1, it turned out that at T3, things were like at T1. I'm now at T5, okay? So I say, between T1 and T3, between T3 and T4, T4 and T5, it's always been that way. So I assume that between T5 and T6, it will be as well. This looks like, then, a probabilistic argument. But you see, all probability arguments rely upon the assumption of uniformity. If you don't assume that the future will be like the past, all the probabilities from the past are just wasted information. Because if we live in a random universe, all bets are off. When the person comes back, let, I hope that wasn't too complicated. Let me make it very simple. When the person says to you, probably the future will be like the past, you want to say, well, you're just begging the question. Because that's the whole question. How do you know the future will be like the past? And they don't have even the first bit of probable reason for believing that unless the future is like the past. So it always comes back on itself. I'm, I'm sorry that so many Christians get bamboozled when it comes to that argument. It's such a strong one when they hear people say, well, okay, I don't know for sure, but very probably. No, you don't even know very probably unless there's uniformity in the world. If there's uniformity, you, you can make a good probabilistic argument. But uniformity is the very thing we're debating right now. So you can't in, import that as an assumption to prove what you are supposed to be proving. So what do we have here? We have two worldviews in conflict. And now the one worldview of atheism ridicules you for your Sunday school faith in Jesus and believing the Bible and all that. But you know, with that very simple understanding of the world, God made the world, He made me, He sent His Son to die for my sins, that very simple worldview, I can do some real powerful things. The whole history of science is based upon that assumption, that God controls the universe in a regular way and gives man the mental capability to have dominion over the world. I can build factories and send rockets to the moon and bridges and cure polio and do all sorts of things not directly from the Bible to a cure for polio, but given the biblical worldview, then I can go out and learn more about the world, use inductive inference, and someday cure polio. But given the atheist worldview, you can't even go to the lab the very first day. It doesn't make sense. Now you may be sitting there thinking, but atheists do science, Dr. Bonds. In fact, many atheists have done and accomplished more than Christians in science. And I agree with that. So we'll come back to that. It's not really a problem. Well, let me give you the answer. It just goes to show that atheists are not very good atheists. It goes to show that they say one thing with their mouth and believe another thing in their heart. They say there is no God, there's a random universe, but in their heart of hearts they believe in regularity. They don't worry, I mean, they worry in the cautious sense that any scientist should, that they might have an explosion or something like that. But they don't worry that if they've done some safe procedure many times in the past, tomorrow it may blow their head off. But given their view of the universe, they should be very worried. They have no way of knowing what's going to happen in the future. The problem of induction undermines materialistic atheism because it makes science impossible. If I were a materialistic atheist and I held to that view consistently, I wouldn't worry about stubbing my toe tonight. Because for all I know, that will be the thrill of a lifetime. <laughs> for all I know. Okay, let's talk about the problem of deduction now. Deductive inference relies upon the laws of logic. When we deduce conclusions, we take the laws of logic and truths that we know, and we, uh, we, we do operations upon these truths according to the laws of logic and draw down other conclusions. Ah, that sounds so apt. Deduction is what, uh, well, Sherlock Holmes was supposed to have done a lot of. 
kind of like he gets a lot of information, then he knows that there are certain laws of thought and relationships, and from that information, he deduces a conclusion. Let's see if we can deduce a conclusion. I'll test your logical ability here. What if I say that all men are mortal and Gary DeMar is a man? What would you deduce from these two truths? All men are mortal, Gary DeMar is a man. Ergo, Gary DeMar is mortal. Okay? Now, is that a legitimate deduction? Well, we know that it's a legitimate deduction. I can't give you a whole course in logic, although I'm going to hope that some of you will sign up for my course in logic correspondence-wise. You can learn a lot from that. But we know this because there's a law of logic that allows for that kind of connection between what we call classes. The class of men, the class of mortals, and the single member class, Gary DeMar. And the relationship between these classes goes like this. All P is Q, all D is P, therefore all D is Q. Okay, and it's the law of logic, categorical inference. Now, if we did not have laws of logic, if we only relied upon one-time experiences, one-time experiences, one-time experiences, all isolated from themselves, we would never be able to advance our knowledge. We'd never be able to relate classes or propositions to each other. We could only know momentary experiences. But because the laws of logic are valid, then we're able to learn a whole lot about things that we haven't had an experience of. If I know that all men are mortal, and I know that Gary is a man, I don't have to wait to see if Gary dies. I can tell you, he is mortal. It follows from the premises that he is mortal. Okay. Now you're thinking, yeah, but what if he doesn't die? Well, then if he doesn't die, the proposition that all men are mortal is untrue. But if I know that all men are mortal, let's say God has told me that, and he has, by the way, and you too, in the Bible. If, if we know that all men are mortal, and we know that so-and-so is a man, then we know that that person will die, that person's mortal. That's following a law of logic, and that's known as deductive inference. Another deductive inference goes like this. If P, then Q. The next premise is P. The conclusion is Q. If P, then Q, and we know that P is true, then Q follows from it. And every argument that's in that form, every argument that's in that form, without exception, every argument that follows that form is a valid argument. So that if the premises are true, if P then Q is true, and if P is true, then it follows that Q must be true. And every argument of the following form is also valid. If P then Q, first premise, Second premise, not Q. Conclusion, not P. Okay. If Dr. Bonson is a wealthy man, he will not be living in the dormitory during this conference. Okay. If P, then Q. Q is he will not be living in the dormitory. Now, we know that that's not true, or most of you know that's not true. So it's not Q is the second premise. It is not the case that Dr. Bonson's not living in the dormitory, from which you can deduce he's not a wealthy man, or he's not a wealthy man who would be more comfortable than to live with a bunch of screaming college students till 2 in the morning in the dormitory. The point here is forms of argument. Now, in the two illustrations I've given you about the mortality of Gary DeMar and Dr. Bronson's not getting a lot of sleep, in those two illustrations, at least two things have to be isolated for analysis. First of all, the concept of mortality, the concept of humanity, and then we need to isolate laws like if P then Q, P therefore Q. So we have classes or categories, human beings, 
Gary DeMar is a class as well, a one-member class. You all know that, a set with one member. Gary DeMar is a concept, humanity is a concept, mortality is a concept, and then this law, this relationship of all P's and Q's and if P then Q and so forth. So we have laws and we have categories. Am I going too fast? If anybody is lost, it's my fault because there's nothing really difficult about what I'm saying. So you let me know and I'll say it again. To do deduction, you need to be able to identify classes and laws of thought, relationships between the classes or laws of logic, if you want to put it that way. You can't do deduction without it. And you can't do any academic work and you can't understand anything without logic. So a lot's resting on this. So we come down to this. You have to be able to identify classes of things and laws of logic. You are talking to a materialistic atheist who says all of reality is physical in nature. If all of reality is physical in nature, where is the class or what is the category of humanity? Is that a physical thing? Put your thinking hats on now. Be good philosophers. Is the class of humanity a physical thing? I'm not asking, are humans physical? That's easy, yes. Touch ourselves, we're physical. But is the concept or class known as humanity physical? Could anyone put that in their refrigerator and cool it down overnight? No. Could you kick it? No. Could you swallow it? No. Could you burn it? No. Could you trash it? No. You can't touch it, can you? Because it's not physical. How about the class of mortal things? Is the class of mortal things physical? No. Now, is any class physical? Is any set physical? Now, those of you who were here last year, don't you know, steal my thunder, but let me just show you how far this goes. When the unbeliever wants to do reasoning, let's just say it's mathematical reasoning. And the unbeliever says, okay, we know certain deductive relationships, such as... 2 plus 3 equals 5. Okay, now I have a question for you philosophically. Those of you who were not here last year, don't jump, you know, I mean, those of you who were not here can answer. Is this 2 up here on the board? And is this 3? And is this 5? Have I got that right? Is this 2? It is. You want to think about it again? Because if that is two, we have now just destroyed two. There is no more two-ness in this universe. If you tell me that's two, and I blank, actually a blackboard's better if I can erase it, but you get the point, there is no two anymore. Now do you want to reconsider what you just told me? Was that two? That wasn't two, that was the numeral two, which is a representation or instantiation of the concept two. All right? And so here you have the unbeliever who's talking about an immaterial, non-physical set of things known as human beings. An immaterial, non-physical set of things known as mortal beings. An immaterial set of things known as two-ness. All those things which have two-ness about them. Is that physical? Is that something you can go to the refrigerator and say, hey, I think I'm going to pull two out of the refrigerator tonight. Two what? Forget it. Not two what, just two. I'm going to pull two out of the refrigerator. You can't do that. And you can't pull humanity out of your refrigerator, and you can't burn Gary North, or Gary DeMar for that matter. The set, the concept, you cannot do that. Why? Because the concept's not physical. How about the laws of logic? Are laws physical things? How many of you think it's possible you go to the cafeteria tonight, they say, we're serving the laws of logic? You know? As you. <laughs> no! You can't touch the laws of logic. They aren't physical. They're conceptual. 
Okay, I belabored and belabored and belabored the point. But do you understand what's going to happen now? The last step, as I say to Mr. Atheist here, since for you, everything that exists must be material or physical, for you, there can be no laws of logic or class concepts. There can be no numbers. There can be no concept of humanity. There can be no class of mortal beings. There can be no laws of logic. And if for the atheist, there can be no classes and no laws, there can be no deduction. Now you see, we've killed the atheist once, philosophically speaking. And I've just killed him a second time. He cannot use inductive inference, he cannot use deductive inference, which is to say he can't reason at all. Let's talk about another problem. The problem of mind. Remember, we're dealing with someone who is a materialistic atheist. And so does he think that I have a mind or that he has a mind? Can he, if he is consistent, hold that he has a mind? Now this is going to be tough because often in the English language among and outside of scholarly circles, in fact even in some scholarly circles where there's no philosophical precision, people interchange the word mind and brain. But you know there is a difference between a mind and a brain. Okay? It makes sense to say that my brain is five feet ten inches off the floor. It makes no sense to say my mind is five feet ten inches off the floor. Okay, there's a difference between the physical object, the gray matter, the oatmeal above the eyebrows here. There's a difference between the brain and what we call mind. Okay. Is what you think in your mind boil down to what takes place in your brain? I'm not saying is there any relationship at all. I'm saying can it be reduced to what happens in your brain? Is it even theoretically possible for a scientist to open my cranium, do some kind of complicated procedure on the gray matter in there, and say, oh, you were thinking of the Star Spangled Banner just a moment ago, weren't you? No, in fact, it's a long, complicated thing I wish I could get into. I could show you it is theoretically I'm not talking about my knowledge of science. It is theoretically impossible to do that. Because we're talking about two things in a different order altogether. To look at electrons and molecules and synapses and all that has nothing to do with what is the conceptual content being transmitted through, over those synaptic you know, um, arcs and so forth. You cannot tell what a person is thinking by dissecting the person's brain. There's a difference between mind and brain. That's an argument in itself, but apart from the complicated argument, the atheist has got to say, mind reduces to brain. You don't have any thinking process that is a part of your free investigation and choosing. You just have what takes place as an electrochemical response in the gray matter upstairs. Now I'm saying that's the implication of his materialism. He's an atheistic materialist. Okay, now we're going to move in quickly for the kill on this one. If that is true, then you don't have any control over what you think. By the way, some atheists would say, yeah, that's right, you don't. What you think is just, you know, the, like behaviorists would say, the result of antecedent physical causes. And what I'm trying to teach you to do is to run with that. Let them state their worldview and say, okay, where does that take us? If it is true that there is no mind and everything I think is reduced to electrical chemical responses in the gray matter upstairs here, then what I think, I didn't choose to think, and I couldn't prove what I'm thinking to be true. Because I can't help electrical chemical responses that take place in my brain. Now, I know some of you are getting ready to fall asleep. You want to go to dinner. Do you understand why we just savaged the atheist again? See, I, I, I said it nicely. I didn't get loud and yell. But what I just said is, if what you say is true, you have no reason for believing it to be true. Your worldview undermines any confidence you could possibly have in your own worldview. Because on your worldview, all of your talking about atheism is just the result of electrochemical responses in your brain. 
for all we know, you know, the machinery upstairs in your head went wacko. And we're not going to hold you accountable. I mean, you couldn't help it. In fact, no one can help what they think and what they say and what they do. Because there's no mind and there's no freedom about it. It's not as though you looked at all the options, you saw what you consider to be true and chose it. Your brain just kind of cranked out the things that it does and sent the stimulus down to your tongue and you know, made you say the words that you did. So if atheism is true, what I'm getting at is, if atheism is true, there could be no reason to believe atheism to be true. Because if atheism is true, I have no mind, my brain just does what it does, and his does what his does. In fact, here's a great comeback to an atheist, you know, who says, well, there's no mind, it's just brain. You say, well, it doesn't do any good for you to try to convince me then, because my brain just says what it says, and your brain just says what it says. There's no argument. If you are right, Mr. Atheist, we don't even need to debate this anymore. Because after all, there are no laws of logic, there are no laws of science, and we don't even have minds with which to debate. This guy's dead three times over, philosophically. Well, we've got another problem. That's the problem of moral absolutes. Now, if I, if I wanted to, I could just talk to you about simple matters of morality. What, you know, why anybody should be decent to another person, or you know, uh, why we shouldn't you know, pillage, or rape, or burn, and all those sorts of things. We could get into that, but I'm going to keep this kind of academic and dry, because I know you like it that way. <laughs> I'm going to talk about the atheist and the Christian having an intellectual discussion, trying to be rational. Now, he's dead three times over. We already know that. But um, in my debate with uh, Gordon Stein, some of you have heard that on tape, I realize. But in my debate with Dr. Stein, after I'd argued my position, essentially my position was, it makes no sense to come to a debate and debate with somebody unless there are laws of logic. If there aren't laws of logic, there's no debate and no way to evaluate it. Secondly, I said, on your worldview, there can be no laws of logic. Consequently, your coming to the debate proves my position. Yeah, very simply. I mean, I, I may not have put it out just that simplistically for the audience, which was a university audience, but that's what I was doing. I was saying, your appearing at the debate tonight disproves your position. Because you came to debate, that means you assume there are laws of logic, which means you assume that there is an immaterial reality, which is contrary to your atheism. And so, but toward the end, and this is getting on to the point I want to make now, when I had a, um, a final presentation to the audience, I made this suggestion to Dr. Stein, who's on the other side of the stage. I said um, that he really was borrowing from the Christian worldview and not being honest about that. And one way to see it was this. What if I were to take out a gun right now and say, here's how we settle debate questions. Give me an argument why I shouldn't shoot you. You know, he has two ways to go. I've got the gun right on him. 357 Magnum. I said, go ahead, make my day. He's either going to give me no argument and say, well, there aren't any moral absolutes, and if there are no moral absolutes, then it's perfectly all right to win a debate by shooting your opponent. <laughs> really, I'm not playing games here. If, if there are no moral absolutes, then I can win the debate by eliminating you. Not just your thought, your body and everything. <clears throat> You're gone. But if you say, no, 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 it's wrong for you to try to win a debate by shooting your opponent, Dr. Bonson, murder is immoral, then he's going to have to tell me there's more to this universe than just matter in motion, isn't he? He's going to have to appeal to something beyond the material cosmos. Ultimately, he would have to appeal to the personal God of creation, but for our argument here, he's got to go somewhere beyond the physical world to get a moral absolute by which to condemn me in shooting him or trying to shoot him to win the debate. So you see how he's put on the horns of a dilemma? And every atheist you talk to is on the horns of that very dilemma. When I had a dialogue with George Smith, who was another published and very well-known atheist on the John Stewart show, um, Mr. Smith came into that dialogue and wanted to make the point that we should live by reason, not by faith. 
Well, you already know from my lecture that I had him trumped on that because my argument is if you don't have faith, there's no place for reason at all. But more importantly, at the beginning when he was talking about how we have to follow reason and all that, I responded by saying, I agree with you, George. I think we're supposed to follow reason. I know why as a Christian I tell people to be reasonable. I don't know why you do. You know, and it was kind of like, blink, 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 what? <laughs> Come again? I said, how can you as an atheist tell people that they ought, hear that word, ought to be reasonable? In an atheist universe, people should be able to do anything they want. The atheist cannot give a basis for moral absolutes. And that isn't just a way of showing that atheists have got to allow for sexual perversion, abortion, and murder, and all the rest. That's also a way of showing that the atheist can't even do academic work. And this may come as a surprise to some of you. I, I'm keeping a file of clippings on this, but repeatedly we are finding in the university setting falsification of lab reports for the sake of getting funding to do work. We see people, not just for money, by the way, but also for fame, falsifying results to make themselves out to be the first one to have discovered a certain connection or something like that. And it's incredible, and it's very embarrassing. Because, you see, the university system in the, well, all of the, all of the departments, but let me just begin with the sciences. All of the research and laboratory work that is done in the hard sciences assumes the honesty of the researcher. Have you ever thought about that? It assumes that you're going to make an accurate report of what you found out from the white rats the next day when you went back. But if you start changing the statistics to make it look like your hypothesis really was true, who's going to come along and do the months and months of research to find out that you were lying? And so you see, because most people are unprincipled pagans in the university today, the university is more and more coming up against this embarrassing situation. We're finding out people are fudging on their lab reports, to put it very simply. But now if you were an atheist, you should say, so what? It's different strokes for different folks. This is how I, you know, get my money. This is how I get my fame. This is what makes me happy. You know, chill out, bug off, get out of here. It's okay. The university is embarrassed by that. The embarrassment of the university, the embarrassment of the professor, the embarrassment of your roommate over the fact that scientists sometimes lie shows that they believe there are moral absolutes. Those moral absolutes have got to be assumed in every department, though. Let's, just, let's go over to the English department. Let's say you've got an English teacher who's been promoting moral relativism in all of the literature that she gives to you and all of the class discussions and lectures. She's trying to point out that it's different strokes for different folks. And she wants you to imbibe that. She wants you to realize that everything is relative. There are no moral absolutes. It comes the day of the final exam and she wants you to shine on this final exam. Boy, I'd cheat like mad. I mean, not really, but to play the devil's advocate here. I just cheat, you know, like a trooper. In fact, I'd make it real obvious. I wouldn't just kind of look over in somebody's paper. I'd walk right on over there and say, what's the answer to number 12? Thanks a lot. Come back. And what do you think your teacher would do who's been teaching you moral, abs I mean, moral relativism? Teacher would come back and say, what do you think you're doing, Greg? Say, well, I didn't know the answer to number 12, so I wouldn't ask her. <laughs> Does it look right to you? No. <laughs> Just say, you're supposed to do your own work. I'm going to have to, you know, disqualify this exam. You're going to fail the class. Do you think I'm going to move in for the kill? I'm a, you hypocrite. <laughs> you taught us all semester that there are no moral absolutes. Who are you to condemn me? It's different strokes for different folks. I decided to pass this class by using his work. <laughs> Who are you to tell me I can't do that? The atheist cannot live according to his worldview. I used this illustration last year, so pardon me for repeating if, you, if you've come back, but it's one that just sticks with me. When I was in college, it was in the days of the counterculture, Vietnam protests, the sexual revolution, the, the late 60s. What a great time to be alive. 
and I would go on secular campuses, the university and the city college, and, and, and try to witness and talk to people about the Lord and so forth. And I'd run into this combination of ideas over and over and over again. Just blows my mind. On the one hand, you would be talking to an unbeliever. Let's say this guy is living with his girlfriend, okay, and they're not married. So you talk about that, how you know God condemns that and how uh, that guilt needs to be dealt with and how Christ is the Savior and so forth. Well, now, one way to get me off the, you know, his back intellectually about this is to say, hey, it's different strokes for different folks. It's relativism. Makes me happy. There are no absolutes. You can't apply that to me. And then in the very same conversation, that very same person who's just said it's different strokes for different folks and that's why I can shack up with my girlfriend says... The United States is unrighteous to be in Vietnam, and we need to protest and burn down banks and do things to get them out of Vietnam. Uh, excuse me now. How do you bring those two together? It's different strokes for different folks when it comes to your sexual habits, but it's not different strokes for different folks when it comes to military morality. You can't have it both ways. And that's what I was getting at when in our first session... I told you, I'm going to show you that the unbeliever has boarded a plane for Boston and wants to get out at Chicago. And you're going to say, no one's getting off this plane. If you choose materialistic atheism, then I'm going to drive you right into the ground. You cannot do science anymore. If you choose materialistic atheism, drive you right into the ground. You cannot use logic anymore. You cannot presume that your mind or your brain has any trustworthiness about it, you cannot argue that we have to be honest in our lab reports and when we do our final exams. This is fourfold now, the atheist has been savaged. Now let me ask you a question before we end the session. I've done this many times. I've done it publicly before university audiences. I've done it privately in professors' offices. I've done it with individual after individual and after individual. <coughs> what do you think my experience has been when I destroy another person's worldview and show that he can't even reason on the basis of it? Do you think that what they do usually is say, oh yeah, <laughs> I get it. I guess I need to become a Christian then, right? I'm guilty before God. I've been, I've been fighting against all this. You think they just... now? To be honest with you, sometimes, sometimes, people have been so prepared by other tragedies or experiences in their lives that they know there's something terribly wrong, and this is what finally tips it, and they say, yeah, what do you think the answer is? Sometimes it happens like that, but not usually. And I want to tell you that because I did not teach you this technique of destroying the unbeliever's worldview because I want you to expect that that means, boy, you just go out there and boom, 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 you're going to start making conversions. is isn't going to happen that way. By God's grace, I hope you do see people change. But it's not going to come just because you've destroyed internally their worldview. Because the next thing that you're going to see, and this is where we're going to pick up tomorrow, so you're going to see the unbeliever is going to say, oh, well, that can't be true. I mean, I understand why you say theoretically I can't do science, but I do science. And all my unbelieving friends do science. And my unbelieving friends do make choices. My unbelieving friends do believe in morality. My unbelieving friends do science and so forth. So the end believer is going to say, well, I mean, that looks good on paper, but it just isn't true. And so the next step of your apologetic, you see, and this is where you are going to be pushing where it hurts to show the conviction of sin. The next step is going to be to show that, yes, you do science, logic. You do use moral absolutes. And what that proves is you do know God in your heart of hearts. What you've been saying with your mouth does not reflect with what you believe in your heart. As Paul said, you know the truth, and you've been suppressing it in unrighteousness. So we have to talk about self-deception, which is what I did my doctoral dissertation on. The believer is caught in the condition of self-deception. He or she has convinced himself or herself that there is no God, that they don't believe in God, when in fact they really do believe in God and refuse to give thanks, refuse to honor God for who He is. And so I don't want you to think that, I mean, this, in one sense, this is the easy part. I mean, you can savage the unbeliever's worldview, 
But getting him to realize that he's naked, that he's dead, is another thing altogether.